Hey, everybody, this is Birch. Hey, it's been a while. Um, it's actually been uh, two weeks since I've talked to you. And uh, for almost a week, I did a, uh, a complete, you know, this could sound very new agey, so I apologize, but a complete uh, digital detox. There was, there was no, no internet connection for nearly an entire week. It was, uh, it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's, it's, I highly recommend it. Creativity, better, all, all things better. Just, just absolutely recommend that one. Um, but now I'm back and, uh, and while I was gone, you know, it's weird, the kind of things the subconscious kind of plays on with your mind. And so here's a story and it's, it's one of those things where the answer is just kind of, you know, incompetence slash lack of curing. That is the answer. Um, it isn't, it isn't more complicated than that. And what's weird is that answer is likely unsatisfying to everyone. It's unsatisfying to a lot of the people listening to this and, and to a lot of these shows who are struggling to make sense of some of the decisions that get made in the comic industry that really make no sense. But we, we want it to make sense, so we, we struggle against that. And it's also unsatisfying to the people who you know work inside the big two and maybe run news sites and everything else who, you know, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't align with their narrative. Um, but it doesn't, but it, but it would, it would be, it would be so nice if it did. I, I, I was talking to somebody who was like, um, I really wish I could agree with some of the things that get said, but I can't, even though it would arguably be a, you know, a bigger gotcha against the, uh, the big critics of comedy. So without further ado, let me go into a little bit of this thought process. So, um, Conan, the Barbarian, number one, from Titan Comics, is doing extremely well. Uh, you did hear, I think, from the interview from uh, Zub that it's gone to multiple printings. It's having, uh, you know, a term that I've only coined on this show and I've heard nowhere else, the uh, the Kirkman Walking Dead effect, where the, the it, you know, if you look at the sales, you know, from all those sales analysis videos I've done, where the numbers steadily decline, um, this is a case where the numbers are starting to bounce up. So we've seen this with The Walking Dead where, you know, first issue comes out, it gets that bump, and then it just slowly starts to dwindle from there. Except in The Walking Dead's case, it didn't. It, it the, the sales, you know, bounced back up after issue two, three, and it steadily climbed. It's kind of what a lot of people, that, that's kind of what, what you assume is going on with comics, but it rarely happens with comics. See, when you put out a comic that is an ongoing comic, what you would think is that sales numbers would steadily increase if it's a good comic because, you know, word of mouth would get out there. People would start to read it more. People would want to pick up this title. And so, you know, over time, it, the sales numbers should increase. But as you've seen from pretty much everything Marvel has done in, you know, in living memory, the opposite is true. You get the number one bump and then number two is about a 40% drop from there. And then it drops, 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 drops. And then eventually you get to kind of, you know, cancellation level numbers. And that's about the time you start thinking about a reboot and uh, you relaunch with that shiny new number one. It's very covers and you start to cycle all over again, except each time you do that, it does it a little, it, you know, it's, it does not jump as much. It's the law of diminishing returns. Unless, of course, you spring for a high profile creative team, which we have seen Marvel in particular do. Uh, but then that's also becomes a little bit of a bait and switch. It's like, hey, we got Ed McGinnis here on this Avengers book. Oh, but he's gone on issue four. And now we're going to get some really cheap artists out there to kind of balance out our books. I, you know, that's that's been the cycle. So anyway, uh, Conan is not doing it. It sold really well out the gate. It sold over 100,000 copies for issue number one, over 100,000 copies, uh, five printings or six printings. And then its uh, its following issues are, you know, at the little drop for issue two, but now is climbing back up again. And so these are these are good numbers. By the way, um, I saw some, you know, some some people are out there saying the biggest problem the comic industry has. Uh, some people. I saw Heidi uh, McDonald. I, by the way, I'm going to answer another. I'm answering questions. The question was good. I saw Heidi talking about, you know, the big problem from her perspective. This was a clip in a podcast is that there are no reliable comic numbers out there, and that's a problem. And um, I, I agree there aren't reliable comic numbers out there, and I agree that's also a problem. I, I don't think that's... It, like, if I was listing the top 10 problems in comics, that would not be it. Not by a mile. 
because there were a lot of issues with comics and a lot of you know problems of getting creators paid, getting long-term books undone. I mean, we had reliable numbers in 2015, 2016, 2018. We had reliable numbers coming out. Uh, we also had the decimation of you know markets outside the, the direct market. We had you know this this kind of reboot uh, predatory cycle against itself. Uh, anyway, that's it's weird. Um, but the, but the reason I've mentioned this is you can get to numbers. You can get numbers. You know, are, are the publishers all lying? Well, they might, but there's ways you can triangulate numbers today. It's not as easy to do, but if you were say a journalist, you could actually get those numbers. They, they exist. They're out there. And people are, you know, several editors who I would say are passing acquaintances of mine, not friends, are all too happy to share them from a number of different companies. So, you, you I mean, if you're an, an industry insider, a journalist who hasn't burned every bridge, made himself or herself a nuisance, then you should be able to get your hands on it. So I, I'm just saying that that is, you know, by and large out there. I got some other there's I've gotten this um, recent wave, by the way, of people saying, hey, why aren't you talking about um, the, you know, the other side? You go after I.D. McDonald or Rich Johnston, but you don't go after Ethan Van Skyver or Eric July. And they say things that are really offensive on their live stream. Well, number one, um, I don't listen to those live streams. Number two, and I think this is the bigger point. Um, I, I don't go after Heidi McDonald for having an opinion. I don't go after these people for whatever the hell they say about their personal life. I do think it's entirely tasteless if you're talking about somebody's kids and you talk about somebody's families. And I know that uh, what there is, there is something with somebody's kid that went on that was pure, cl- I mean, at zero class for sure. But one thing you'll note in you know the videos is that I will complain about people's opinions and I will complain about what they do in comics, some things they say in comics. What I don't do is I don't get into the uh, personal drama BS of which a lot of people on all sides are happy to engage in. Way people look, way people sound. This is boring. This guy's voice sucks. This person is a cuck. I don't like this person's girlfriend. This person has an ugly husband or wife. This person is a bit, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I have no interest in and, you know, other, so that's why I don't cover that stuff. I don't listen to live streams waiting for somebody to say a dumbass tacky statement. In fairness, I wouldn't have to wait very long because it feels like a lot of these shows are pretty much built on that, but there you go. Anyway, but back to uh, the comment I was, the the other thing I was going to say. So, you know, Titan is selling Conan and they're having a hit on their hands. And, you know, a comic a company of that size having a hit means that it's fairly easy for them to kind of pivot and, you know, try and create another hit. And this isn't like a weird flash in the pan. They happen to catch, an, a, for, you know, a writer, an artist that just blew up out of nowhere. Zub has, has been writing comics for a long time, he is, a, you know, a star, but not, but not superstar. I mean, not like, you know, the, he hasn't had the Bendis treatment at Marvel or DC or the Tom King treatment. And what I mean by that is just the, the publishers like promoting the living hell out of his name. Um, Zub has been, you know, you, you, have, you will know his name if you, you know, have been reading comics, but he's not somebody who they've, they've done a Zub is coming, you know, from, from DC or anything like that. Or even like the way that DC kind of ruled out the red carpet for Zadarsky for, for Batman. Um, or, you know, Jason Aaron, which they're doing now. So it's, it's not like that. He's not like that. But the comic is selling really, really well. So if you are tight, you need to be thinking about, all right, what are some other properties I can do? Your you know, ability to go barter with a, a license holder, like you heard uh, Sean Murphy talking about Zorro, or, or I know Titan does uh, Blade Runner stuff. Your, your ability, if you've had a hit on your hands, to get a favorable deal from the licensor is pretty strong. And all you really have to do, and it sounds simple, but all you have to do is kind of, you know, Try and replicate the same thing by people who legitimately love the property. They're out there, um, you know, put some time and effort into crafting something that's going to be authentic to people who like the property and off you go. And it's a success and this can work. So here comes the, uh, the, the conspiracy theory, kind of what I teased at the very beginning. And then the reason why it is not a conspiracy theory at all. So. You look at what Titan has done with Conan, it seems incredibly simple. You put creators on there who, who legitimately like the book, like the series, 
you have them uh, create a story or at least encourage them to create a story that is authentic to Conan. Meaning if you're, you know, long-term fans would, would recognize it, would see themselves in Conan. They didn't do some, some verting expectations like, uh, what the Scott Pilgrim thing did or, or what they tried with masters universe or other things. They're like, let's do a series where it's all about belief and it has nothing to do with Conan, but we're going to call it Conan. We're going to kill him in the first issue. And then, ah, surprise. And I mean, they, they just, they're like, we know what Conan fans want. We know what the stories are like. We're going to try and deliver solid Conan. We're not going to do like Conan's not going to go uh, like in the middle of the fight, like hashtag violence or anything like we're not going to try and modern. Like we're, we're just going to do legit Conan. Okay. And it works. And that's so, it, you know, it's a success. So if you're Marvel at DC, you're sitting on, you know, Batman, Captain America, Superman. You add kind of DC with Philip Kennedy Johnson doing a very kind of classic Superman. Uh, but they, you know, and, and he got a long run. I mean, I, I've disappointed the run into two, but he did get a long run with that title. And, uh, but, you know, he was doing kind of classic Superman. If you're, if you're Spider-Man, you know, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what to do with this title to generate a bunch of sales, you're like, okay, we can, you know, bait and switch uh, Mary Jane and then give her like a weird dimensional husband and fiction, fictional kids. And then we'll do an ultimate Peter Parker where he's a lot older We'll try that too. I mean, there's like, you can screw around with that concept or you can do what Titan did with Conan and like, let's just deliver the, I hate to say it this way because it's actually, a, you know, a, a good story, but like meat and potatoes, this is what the fans want. Let's give them what they want. Why is that so hard? So the conspiracy person in me starts to go, is this Marvel and DC just trying to spend as little money as possible? And basically, you know, try and encourage a couple uh, other properties to get more popular. Basically, you know, these independent companies give them a chance to, uh, you know, get get some momentum, get a little bit of funding, get get the track record. I mean, because, again, Titan, if they can just play their cards right over the next three years and do like four or five other series in the same way, treated well, get a core following. They're going to be quite strong. I mean, comic terms, that's quite strong. You know, and if they can investigate other distribution channels, uh, great, all the better. I know they're, they're doing some of that already. So this is smart business. So if you're Marvel and DC, you know, again, the conspiracy person in me goes, well, they're just kind of, you know, phoning it in at the moment. Try to spend very little money, keep the brand more or less alive um, as a licensable property and wait for a couple of these other and then basically go and say, you know what? We don't really want to do comics anymore. Why don't you just license it? You seem to know what you're doing. And uh, we'll just take the money and we'll split it with you. And, you know, Spider-Man's a really s- strong property. So you can you can do all that. And then we'll just, uh, we'll just take the profits here. And that would be a really clever strategy if you're a Marvel and DC. Keep in mind being owned by Warner and, and Disney, comic book publishing and all the rest. You know, you could argue, they would deny it, but you could argue it's a little bit of a nuisance for them. It's a part of their business. It's not, you know, corporate synergistically aligned with uh, the rest of their business. And it just, you know, in, in many ways could be seen as an annoyance, but it's a great license. Maybe less great if the movies start to, to topple, but even if the movies completely tank, in comic terms, being able to go, hey, we've got uh, Spider-Man, you would pay a decent amount of money and you would give a high revenue share or revenue split to a license holder for Spider-Man, and you could get out of the headache of having to deal with the annoying fans, make it work within Disney's publishing schedule, all the rest. So what you would do, but but the problem is, you know, today, who do you license that to? IDW? I mean, that's on the brink of bankruptcy, Dark Horse. A lot of these companies are struggling mightily. You could say, well, you know, let's let Kirkman kind of stand up a bunch of stuff and, you know, we could have Skybound take all the Marvel comics, but you know, that that's there's no guarantee that would work quite well. And he has a deal with Amazon, which is in somewhat conflict with Disney. So it's not the best. He's not the best license holder to go do all this. And, you know, plus he has some negotiating power as well with his other deals. So, you know, he's not a he's not an ideal candidate. The ideal candidates are either. Well, plus an image, you know, isn't necessarily the best partner for a Marvel or DC. Anyway, it's not their model to license stuff out. So it'd be really clever. If, you know, these companies kind of just kept their properties alive, 
kind of, you know, from the sidelines, encourage some of these defendants to, you know, get stronger, get healthier, then take your license. It'd be, you know, from a business perspective, be a profitable, smart thing to do. Um, that's, you know, it, it would be an explanation. This feels like something that should be written in a bounding into, co- you know, anyway, like it, it feels like it should be written in some kind of a conspiracy nut job site. Um, cosmic book news. That was the site I was, I was searching my brain for cosmic book news. It feels like something that would be well served there. Um, and it makes sense, right? It would give an answer to why some of these terrible decisions get made and why it feels like nobody cares. Well, because they're kind of intentionally just letting it, you know, languish a little bit until this thing, uh, you know, can pop up. And, you know, if, if you were a, you know, a, a, company, you know, operating manager or anything else, this, this would be a reasonable tactic, reasonable strategy to take. However, it would also be a very clever strategy. And the problem is there's no indication that, uh, you know, the, the people in charge of these companies have that kind of business foresight or thought it, it would be plus, you know, the, the people who would benefit would be the upper level editorial and they would become basically license holders. It would it would not be got a good job security for them. So there's a couple of people at the very, very top, the David Gabriels, et cetera, who this would be a decent strategy for. But to the majority of companies, no. And it's the majority of the company editorial, et cetera, that are hiring some of these people and making some of these decisions that are, you know, so poor. So it 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 unfortunately, no. It would be a clever strategy. It would require a lot of intelligence to do it. So I I I defeat my own idea there. <laughs> you know. But anyway, these are the kinds of things that uh, you think about when you're drinking a lot of whiskey and and just uh, enjoying no internet. I recommend that everybody try that at some point in the near future. Anyway, there you go. Sharing that with you. Wow, what what a what a waste of a video, right? I don't know. Thanks for listening. Sell crazy someplace else. We're all stocked up here.